let's start the lecture so this is ee698g lecture 23 so we have seen the one port view for the oscillator what is this perspective of looking at the oscillator circuit what is the key idea here if we ha in this concept of looking at the oscillator as a one port you can refer to your notes um acha okay the one ha ha so that is a feedback making sure that the feedback is positive right any answers how did we end the lecture last time right so you have some lossy resonator and if we can connect a negative resistance parallel to that lossy resonator such that this negative resistance cancels out any positive resistance in the resonator then you can have sustained oscillations forever you basically have to replenish any losses in the resonator in every cycle using this additional unit right okay? so you have some lossy resonator and you connect a negative resistance such that the losses get cancelled so now we have to figure out how to implement negative resistance if i simply take a transistor and connect its gate and drain together right or in other words if i apply a v in here i apply the same v in here what would be the resistance looking down 1 by 0 now instead of applying v in here if i make this minus v in so let's say i had a gain of minus 1 here the current will flow in the opposite direction right which means the resistance is now a negative 1 by gm and this is the principle that we used in the cross coupled oscillator right so when we had a connection like this so the voltage here is appearing here and if you think of the differential symmetry that would mean that this has to be minus vx right you can subtract out any common mode and the remaining things will have a differential symmetry so which is why looking in you had minus 2 by gm as the resistance now another interesting circuit that gives you negative resistance is a circuit i sketched on the board so let can you calculate z of j omega so you have let's say a capacitance c1 connected between the gate and the source another capacitance c2 connected between the drain and the source and you are interested in the z of j omega looking in like this what did you get the result as g m plus j omega c1 plus c2 Whole divided by s square plus minus omega square minus omega square c one c one c two. Did you assume this to be ground? Huh. It's not ground in this. At least not yet. You are. So you have applied V T here. did you assume that this is at vt no huh. so uh, let me give you the result that you should be getting and how you can uh, so some you mistake can assume that that of vt can be the that node is zero so which so node you get either down or at zero okay and then you uh, assume yes, huh. but the result doesn't look correct oh, no no the result is fine yeah the result is correct so how you can solve this is 
uh, again, you could have solved it in multiple ways, but those of you who didn't get there yet, assume some current IT through this, right? The same current IT is flowing through C1. That will develop a voltage VC1 here. So, GM times VC1 will be the current through the MOSFET. What is the potential across C2? That will be equal to VC1 plus VT. Right? Now, based on this, you can calculate what is the current flowing through this. You know the potential across C2. You can calculate what is the current flowing through C2. So, IT should be equal to GM times VC1 plus IC2. Okay. If you are assuming uh, some node to be 0, for example, if you assume this to be 0, then you cannot take this node as VT. Okay. To assume that this is VT, you will have to assume this node is to be 0. Okay. And the Z of J omega you get. So, can you make sense of this equation? You have given me an expression, but is there a way to rewrite it so that it becomes more intuitive? So this is 1 by j omega c1, if you solve this portion, plus 1 by j omega c2 minus gm by omega square c1 c2. So far okay? Now what does this mean? Uh, what is this connection? C1 and C2 are in series. Right? So C1 and C2 are in series. This is in series with a negative resistance. Is that clear? So this equivalent circuit is C1 in series with C2. So this has a capacitance value of C1, C2 by C1 plus C2 with a negative resistance whose value is given by minus gm by omega square c1 c2. So far okay? Now once you have this, you can take any lossy inductor and connect it here. As long as you ensure that this series resistance of the inductor is cancelled by this negative resistance, the circuit can now oscillate forever. So you have R, L, C. This is your L, this can become your C and uh, under resonance you will have this and this cancel. So you will have to choose your resonance frequency. Then you will not put any C in the you don't need to, but if you need to change your uh, resonance frequency, you can put a C. Right, so the circuit we have taken, let me remind you once again. You have C1, C2 and now you have connected an inductor here. Right. This circuit has three nodes and hence this configuration is called as a three-point oscillator. <laughs> so, this one you can ignore the LC tank and the remaining circuit is what is giving you the... Uh, okay. uh, there is nothing... Uh, this, one, this is itself the oscillator. We have not biased the circuit yet, but this is the critical idea. So, I thought you were just taking the LC tank. No, not the LC tank, right? So, in the previous cross-coupled oscillator, you needed that uh, cross-coupling of the transistors to give you the negative resistance. Now, you have the negative resistance between these two terminals because of this configuration. Yes. Huh. In the inductor? You will have to connect the inductor between these two terminals. So, between these two terminals, so this circuit is now equivalent to 
some capacitance and a negative resistance. Correct? Which means I can potentially connect an inductor here and this becomes a series RLC. So. Right? And this inductor can have some loss associated with it and it has to cancel out with the negative resistance that you provide. Okay, so now let's talk about biasing the circuit. There are three nodes and you can choose one of them as your AC ground and bias the rest of the nodes appropriately. Right, so a lot of biasing configurations are possible. The overall configuration of your oscillator can look very different even though we are starting from the same code. So let's assume that the source of the transistor <coughs> is what you are choosing as your AC ground. So let's say I connect this to ground. Okay. Huh. So let, it, it can be, it's an AC ground, right? I can connect this to ground and it will still become an AC right. ground. Okay. Now, how can I bias this point? So the way how we look about it is, we want the uh, bias to be an AC ground. Right? We make one of the nodes as the AC ground and then you do DC biasing and the rest of the circuitry such that it also becomes an AC ground in the small cell. So I connect this to ground, DC bias is 0, AC ground, this is also an AC ground. Now let's say I want to ensure the current that is, we fix the bias of this transistor by fixing the current. Right? What can I do? Now, once I do this, is the gate voltage set for the DC bias? Why? So, let me replace the inductor with inductor and a series resistance. This is the loss associated with the inductor. How does the DC picture look like? You have this. RS. Why is it not set? Current cannot go into the gate. But they will get the same voltage, right? Yeah. This is a diode connected transistor, its VGS is set. Right? So the DC bias for the circuit is set correctly. It's okay. Okay, so now the second question I have is, uh, do you think you will be able to analyze this using the Barkhausen criteria and still figure out whether the circuit can oscillate or not? So how would you break the loop? Right? You have to first identify what is minus H of S in the circuit. How would you do that? So the Barkhausen criteria is for the small signal circuit. The question is clear? Yeah. Yeah. So take a minute and see if you can at least sketch out where your, uh, how we would calculate the minus H of S, even if you can't do the expression. So let me redraw the image quickly. So first I'll start with the small signal model. This is connected to ground. So from here you have an RS. There is an inductor. And there is a C1 here. You have C2 connected from the drain of the MOSFET to the ground. I will simply draw it like this. So now to test it, let's say I break the loop here. I can apply a V-test 
and see how much is the return voltage coming here. Then you can do V test by, sorry, V return by V test, and this will be equal to minus of H of S. And once you solve this, you will find out what is the magnitude of H of S, gain of uh, phase of H of S, and then you can equate it to the Barkhausen's criteria. Any questions on this? Correct. When you break the loop, the loading effect shouldn't change. In your method, I will have to because once you break it here, huh, if you break it, it looked correct at the beginning, but now I don't think it is correct. Let's say you break it here and you apply a V test. You will have something returning here, right? But the uh, current flowing through this will generate a voltage here depending on the load seen at that node. The, let, let's say some current is flowing through here. So in your method, you are breaking the loop here, right? So you will have some voltage coming here. Let me call it as V feedback. Corresponding to that, you will have some current flowing through this. Right? Now, the voltage that it develops here, to take that into consideration, you will need to think of the proper load there. So, no, no, you applied the VT here. Ah, so that, that voltage is fixed now, really. This voltage is fixed and you have broken the loop open here. Ah, but now that uh, this, uh, will be a current source, right? The, the MOSFET will be acting as a current source. MOSFET is acting as a and current source. GM into S VFP. GM into VFP. VFP. All of that and current is flowing through C2. And the voltage across the current source can be anything. We can think about it. That will be fixed at VT. This, this node is fixed at VT, right? And you need to find out the uh, voltage here. Okay. Right. And this voltage is now developed across C2. Ah. Why don't you uh, solve this? Right? Ha. Solve using both methods and then you will see that they are different. And then you can think about why they are coming out as different. So what are the same loops? You can break the loop from the any point you want. You can't break the loop at any point you want. So solve this and then check. If you had the loop in terms of a block, uh, right, in terms of a, a proper H of S, G, etc., then when you break the loop, you don't have so much confusion. But now you'll have to be a little bit more careful. Some other question? It is feasible to, yeah. yeah. So generally we prefer to break the loop at the high impedance node. There is more nuance to this discussion, but this is a good of, good number of rule to remember. Okay. So uh, can you repeat? We have a so you don't create the negative resistance for it to exactly cancel. You will have to have a larger, you'll have to have a more negative resistance. So if the value of the negative resistance is minus R, right, the magnitude of R has to be larger than the resistance you expect to be there in the circuit. Which means it will start out as a small signal growing oscillation. This will grow and eventually reach the uh, limits of the uh, small signal model, right? Which means the transistor is likely to come out of saturation and then non-linearities will settle in and because of that, the value of the negative resistance is going to reduce and yeah, and eventually it will settle to sustained oscillation. So we will never design it for the exact value of the loss because across PVT there are there is a possibility that your circuit will not even oscillate. 
right? So you'll always decide it to be more negative than what is required. And then the uh, large signal non-idealities will bring it back to a sustained oscillation. Okay. So now we assumed one unit, sorry, one node of this, this node to be the uh, small signal AC ground in the beginning. What happens if I assume this node as my AC ground? So it doesn't make sense to connect it to ground directly. So let's say I connect this to VDD. What should I do to this node? I'll connect a current source to the ground. Okay. Now this inductor in the small signal picture is connected to ground. Right? It's basically connected to VDD in the large signal picture. So just to make it pretty, I'm going to sketch it like this. Okay. The capacitor C2 is between an AC ground and this node. So the usual convention is to simply connect it from this node to ground. So this is another popular architecture that is used. Is it okay? You can also keep the gate as your AC ground. So how do I make the gate as the AC ground? I can connect it to VDD or I could connect it to some V bias, right? some bias voltage. Can you comment on what I should do here? I could connect it to ground, but let's say I connect this to a current source. Right? Now this inductor is connected between an AC ground and this node. Right? So instead of connecting to V bias, I can also connect this to VDD. Right? Now is there a capacitance that I can connect between ground and a node? Is there a, uh, you can look at whether there is, uh, C1 is, this node of the C1 is connected to AC ground, right? which means I could change this connection from here to the ground directly. So this is another possible configuration and this configuration is called as the Colpitts oscillator. Now if you play around with how you are connecting the biases, for example you could have kept this to V bias itself right? instead of connecting it to VDD, you can come out with more configurations but the three configurations I have showed you now, they are more uh, popular than the others. Now, yeah. We are So, in the small signal model, your circuit has to look like this, where one of the three nodes can act as the AC ground. That is the only constraint. The analysis that you have done for the calculation of negative resistance was a small signal analysis. Right? As long as that small signal model is valid, you will get a negative resistance out of it. Okay? So in the DC picture, it doesn't really matter whether a node is connected to V bias or VDD. As long as in the small signal model, that node is equivalent to AC ground, your negative resistance will come out correct. Yes, the, you will have to choose your DC bias values, the current value, V bias value, etc., such that the transistor has to be in saturation. Okay. So now this uh, three-point oscillator structure is uh, very interesting because based on the score structure, you can come up with a lot of oscillator varieties. And these options were very popular earlier when the transistor itself was very costly right? because the cross coupled oscillator has two transistors whereas this has only one transistor but these days the cost of the transistor cost of a single transistor has come down a lot 
Therefore, uh, we generally prefer the cross-coupled oscillator because it is uh, more robust to design, you have more control over the amplitude, etc. But if you are doing discrete oscillator uh, implementations, wherein you have discrete components and then assemble everything on a breadboard or a PCB, Colpitt's oscillator or one of the other versions is still used. So any questions so far? If so, let's say I want to design a ring oscillator, right? Let us go through some of the design choices that we might make if you want to design a very basic ring oscillator. You are simply given a specification that you have to design a ring oscillator at 2 gigahertz. Now, of course, we all understand that with PVT variation, this 2 gigahertz number is going to be very difficult to achieve across corners. Let's worry about that a little later, right? Let's say you are working at a typical corner under typical conditions now and you want to get a basic ring oscillator structure working at 2 gigahertz. Where would you start? What all would you do? I mean, there are typically two approaches. One is you identify what are the design variables involved, right? Every single width, length, any parameter that you can think of will identify. Then you will take a sophisticated tool, put parametric analysis left and right on all these variables <laughs> and cross your fingers. So this is one method. This is what we call as a spice monkey method, right? Wherein uh, this is similar to how if you have enough monkeys on enough typewriters and you wait long enough, you will eventually get Shakespeare out of it, right? One of the Shakespeare novels out of it. But if you are working in a company with a strict deadline, uh, very less chances that you will finish your design on time. The other approach is the completely mathematical approach where you try and figure out all the equations. Right? Of course, uh, as is always the case, the right method is going to be somewhere in the middle. You will get intuitions from equations and you will also rely on the tools. Right? So, how would you start? I want a ring oscillator operating at 2 gigahertz. Right. So, basically something like this, right? You have odd number of inverters and then you connect this in a loop. Correct. N has to be odd. What else? Time delay of each inverter. Any other parameter? No, not right now. Let's assume that you have to do it at one Capacitance to tune. So that capacitance is, uh, so right now we'll not worry about the tuning part, right? You would do tuning and then try and lock the frequency to something to overcome the PVT issue among other things. Right? So let's not worry about the tuning part. So why do you say these are the two parameters? Because the frequency of oscillation is given by 1 by 2 n td. So, of course, n is one parameter and what is td a function of? Uh, huh. It's a function of current, what else? Current and capacitance, what else? It is Huh. Threshold voltage of the transistor, let's say, is fixed by the process. Let's for now assume that VDD is also fixed. We don't have a lot of options in changing the VDD. Then you have W and L, right? And W, L, and L are going to indirectly affect the current and the capacitors, right? So basically, you have to worry about W, L, and you may also, uh, you can also add a capacitance additionally, okay? So because we are starting out, there is no particular reason to choose a larger n, right? we are just starting. So let's choose the minimum possible n, which is 3. Right? So you start with n equal to 3. What comments can you make about the transistor sizes, w and l's of the transistors? You start with minimum length, right? You start with a minimum length n MOS and a, a minimum w by, w by l p MOS. Okay, that is a good starting point. Now, before I start to simulate this, right? Now, the best thing to do is simulate it, find out what is the frequency you are getting, right? Before I start to simulate this, is there anything else that I need to take care of? 
Why is VM? It doesn't settle to the midpoint voltage. Uh -huh. huh, okay. Uh, how would you ensure that? So that is yeah. In simulation, you don't usually have it can settle at VM, right? It can settle at VM, but if you are Supply voltage, let's say when you are simulating, you give a step in the supply voltage where it goes from 0 to VDD. This sort of thing is usually sufficient to ensure that it oscillates. You understood the problem you say. One of the possible solutions for this system is all the transistors settled to the midpoint voltage. We won't have latch up issues if you have odd number of inverters. If you have even number, then you can, then you won't have oscillation, then it will latch. What are we missing? We, the sharp transition of the transistors. Um, by sharp transition? Huh. Maybe the time to travel So we'll do one point at a time. So you suggested sharp transition. This will so how would the output of this look like? Let me call this as V out. Do you think these will be perfect square waves at the output? This is not going to be a perfect uh, square wave at all, right? It's more like a distorted sine wave. And the reason is, uh, so if I were to call this as n1, n2, n3, right? The moment you have transition in n1, your n2 will start to fall down somewhere here, right? Your n3 is going to go up somewhere here, which means by the time your N3 is going up, your it's time for the N1 to fall down. So it's going to fall down very quickly. So it's going to look more like a distorted square, a sine wave than a proper square wave. Now, if this is a concern, there are two things you can do. One is you increase the number of N. Yeah, you increase the number of stages so that the waveform has enough time to settle. Is that okay? The other option is to simply use a good buffer at the output. So let's say you had a waveform like this and you pass it through a very strong buffer. That buffer is going to sharpen the edges for you, right? So that will do a right? If the uh, faces, if you need all the faces to be equal, right, then adding a single buffer here is a problem. You will either have to... Yeah. This formula will not be exactly, you will have to find out the, you will have to add the delay separately. Right? So, this formula is assuming all of the stages have equal delay. If that is not the case, you will have to sum up the delay separately and take twice of that. So, if you have a inverter, right, and if you design this inverter with good W by L, even if your edge is rising very slowly, the output can fall faster. Okay, that's all. So, even if your inputs are rising slowly, you can have a, a good inverter or stages of increasingly sized inverters such that the output becomes sharper and sharper. So, like you mentioned, it is possible that sometimes you are interested in maintaining equal faces between the uh, uh, ring. Right? You may want to look at multiple phases of the clock. In such cases, you will either have to increase the number of stages, penalty is the frequency is going to reduce. So, you will have to see if that is okay. Or you can simply add the same dummy load at all points. Okay? So, either of these are options. Now, but uh, sir, we are not talking about adding loads here, right? What happens to your frequency? So, if I add a buffer here, yeah. delay increases, the frequency is going to reduce, right? In practice, if you create a ring oscillator, this ring oscillator is going to drive something. You don't just put a ring oscillator there for the sake of putting it. 
right? Which means your ring oscillator. Definitely have a buffer. Ha. Yeah, it's most likely going to have a buffer. Or if you are using it to uh, let me put an inverter now. If you are using it to, if you are going to access multiple nodes, then all of these stages will have some sort of load connected here. And all of these loads are going to change your frequency, which means you should take into consideration this load during the simulation. And the best way to do it is add that load physically. So if you have a bigger circuit that needs to be driven, you will usually have an inverter or a stages of inverters here. right? So you add that first stage of inverter into your schematic when you are designing the ring oscillator. No. So you add the load and then design for the required frequency. You should always know what the load is. You should always know what the load So you can do that. What will happen is you will uh, design your ring oscillator. Uh, once everything is done, you will add your load. Then you will de redesign the ring oscillator. So that is double the time, right? If you are putting buffer, then you don't need to know the load, right? That also is true. So if you don't know what that exact load is right now, then you simply add two stages of buffer inverters straight away, right? And then this is the node that is going to drive the uh, outside load, right? So you can have your ring oscillator ready, and if you find out that the load to be driven is much larger than what you have designed these buffers for, you simply add more buffers here at later stage. Is that okay? So, and one quick question here. Even if we don't, even if we put one buffer, the, we are putting buffer just so that the load, the capacitance is at that the down, the yes. main yes. is fixed. Yeah. So that will remain fixed even if we put a lot. The huh, load is more or lower. Right, right, right. So what I said is, if the load is higher, you can later add buffers here that will yeah. not affect yeah. your ring. Yeah, yeah. Right. And this, the ring frequency will remain the same. So now, yeah. if you it doesn't affect the ring, the ring's frequency is safe, right? That's what we want. But the problem in connecting this is, what do you mean by the load is higher, right? The load is higher because huh, capacitance is higher. Why is that a problem? Because the rise time here is going to be uh, worse off than whatever was the specification. Right? So this module will have some specification on how much can be the rise time, how much can be the fall time with respect to delay. Right. So if that is the scenario, then you will have to connect uh, a better driver here to drive the load. But whatever you do at that stage, your ring frequency is still safe. You are not getting affected there. So, does the load here matter for the clock faces here? Right, so this you will have to make sure, right? So, all of these you will have to connect to the same inverter. First inverter should be the same. So, let me ask you another question. Is it enough to have one inverter? Is it enough to have the first inverter same? Or should I make sure that the second inverter is also identical across the stages? So let's call this as I1. I make sure all of these are I1. So should I make sure that the second inverter is also same in these cases? How does matching? I'm interested in the frequency of the ring. So let me rephrase the question, right? Uh, do I need to consider the second inverter also if my intention is to make sure that the ring's frequency is not changed? So this is. Let's say one inverter from the ring, 
and so let's say this is my first inverter do i need to consider what load is seen by this which means i put another inverter or this is okay why is it required as this node, not this node. This node? That is dynamic, right? All the capacitances are dynamic, right? We just, uh, if we just put one inverter and check this, uh -huh. the capacitance is saying this, and when we. Okay. We need C2 basically to analyze this. Why? We have never no C2, there have been no uh, D dynamic. So, I am interested in the frequency of the ring now. Yeah. The question is, does C2 affect the frequency of the ring? If so, why? Yes. Why? It affects C1. How does it affect C1? C1 is dependent on a lot of things. Not a fixed thing. We usually take all the back okay. off, and the reality is very different. It depends on the current that flows, the biasing or... True. Flows. How does this affect, how does C2 affect C1? If there will be no C2, it uh -huh. will just intrinsic uh, capacitor. The, the C self of that inverter, uh -huh. that will be less. So the So you are saying during the transition, transition times, uh -huh, yeah. uh, presence of C2 is going to affect the value of V out during the transition. Right? Yeah. That's what you are saying. Yeah. That will affect the gate capacitances and which contributes to C1. Yeah. Is that okay? So so, the uh, reason he has said is not through the feedback. All that he is saying is there is some CG here, right? And there is another uh, CG here. Let's call this as CGN and this is CG. So, C1 consists of the self capacitance of this inverter, the gate capacitance of this inverter, as well as the gate capacitance of this inverter. The gate capacitance here is also a dynamic capacitance. Its value will change as your bias voltage changes. Right? So, the bias voltage which is V out, the drain voltage is V out, is a function of C2. So, because of that, when if C2 is not present, during the transition, the rate at which V out is changing is going to be different. Therefore, the gate capacitance will be different, which means your C1 is effective. So, this is actually a very, very minor point compared to the, yeah. uh, compared to another effect. This is true. I am not saying it is incorrect. This is true. But there is another effect that is more prominent. You have a CGD here. Uh, right? CGD CGD, right? The CG consists of multiple capacitance. Uh, right? But uh, even if you... Ignore the variations in uh, the CGD across corners. You the C2's effect is still appearing at the output because it's connected through CGD. CGD. Right? There is a coupling capacitance there, which is why when you are considering the load, it's usually a good practice to consider two stages. Okay. Right. Miller compensation of CGD. We want to, because this has the individual... You calculate the Miller capacitance. Miller compensation is a... That's right, right. Miller compensation. Then CG will be a sum of a lot of capacitance, right? One of them will be the Miller component of this CG. Correct. And then CG is that we already know. Okay. Huh. So but when you are simulating, so this is theory, right? When you are doing the analysis, when you are simulating, you will have to take into consideration both the stages. So that, but if you are doing the theory, then you can do Miller capacitance to get a first order approximate. It doesn't remove the problem, but it, yeah, you are taking into account that also during simulation. Else what happens is, let's say you started out by connecting only one inverter. You ran your simulation, find out that this is going to operate at some frequency F1. Then your design is completed, you give it to some system level engineer who is going to connect the next stage to this. The moment he connects the next stage, the frequency of your ring is going to change. 
right but if you already had two stages here you would see the correct frequency in the simulation itself we are designing for a acha minimum requirement of inverter is two if you put two that is usually sufficient you don't see a lot of changes after that all right so from now on instead of drawing the inverter like this i will simply show a total capacitance at this node we will call this as some c total so this consists of the load capacitance i will not draw the load explicitly but when you do the simulation you will have to use the load explicitly like put the transistor level circuit right so that the load is taken into account correctly so now the c total is a function of self capacitance of this inverter the load capacitance the gate capacitance of this inverter anything else what all does the c total consist of the self of the first inverter correct self capacitance of the first inverter the load of the the load connected and the gate capacitance gate of, of this the what else wiring wiring capacitance right so when you are doing the schematic you will not know what the wiring capacitance is which means when you go from schematic to layout you can expect the frequency to come down a little so for the very first time when you do it you might not have a good estimate but if you are designing the second or third time in the same process during the schematic only you will be able to roughly add the value of capacitance that you expect from uh, layout parameters right but this of course is an iterative process whatever value you add is going to be rough so from schematic you go to layout and then you'll have to come back to schematic to correct for it. okay so and this way estimating the wire and yeah that is true no, we can we can do model it like one r and c it can be r c r c r c correct that is true modeling it is not very easy but it is possible ah. right uh, so usually you would uh, start with a schematic anywhere you are dealing with the delay my approach is to get from schematic to the first layout very quickly and then you do iterations with layout also in picture now one more correction so you will run the simulation you will take into account all the load you will run the simulation and what you are likely to see is that your output is not reaching vdd your vdd is going to be somewhere here right that's because the pmos has also been designed for minimum strength and typically the pmos will have lower drive strength than the nmos so while you will be able to touch the ground level properly this is going to come down even before it reaches vdd so then you can redesign your pmos sizes alone such that the drive strength matches right okay so now we will call this as our reference design drive strengths are equal if the drive strength are equal then it will sorry The ah. then it should go till VDD. Otherwise, what will happen is that it will start swinging, right? It might swing like this, might not reach ground and might not reach VDD. But it can. It's possible that it can swing somewhere in the middle. Like the time needs to go till VDD is less, almost more than VDD. Correct. Right. You need at least three TD. Three uh, TD is the time it has from zero to VDD. After that, it will fall. After that, it will fall down. So you may want to look at how you can reduce the uh, time taken for it to rise. Okay. So with this, we have now reached our reference design. Let me summarize what we have done. We started with. minimum n and minimum w by l then we considered all the loads required right we considered the loading at all the nodes so we did this so that the cl is also calculated at least cl is represented in the circuit I should say c total and then we sized the pmos for equal drive strength
So now you have your reference design. It consists of, let's say, we are okay with three inverters. So if, assume that this is, this has an oscillation frequency of F0, right? How do you think its current consumption is going to look like? So what I mean by this is, all of these are drawing some current from a VDD. That's fine. You expect to see a spike, right? At what frequency do you expect to see the spike? Uh, F2F0. Why 2F0? So you have the, uh, let's say your V out with respect to time looks like this. Right? Can you comment on how your uh, current waveform is going to look like? Take a minute to think and answer. For now, I'll simply call this as my VM. So if you have an inverter, we are looking at the current being drawn from the supply, right? Let's say you have a capacitance here. Now if you have a falling edge at the input, which means you expect to see a rising edge at the output. So that is happening because through the PMOS, the capacitor is charging. Right? Which means when you have a falling edge at the input, if I were to look at the uh, current waveform, corresponding to this, you will have a spike. Right? Because this current is flowing. Now, once this has charged to VDD, right? then the VDS across this MOSFET goes to zero. The VSD across the MOSFET is zero. Both of them are at VDD. Therefore, it doesn't draw any more current. Therefore, it goes to zero. Right? Now, when you have the next rising edge, right, which means you expect to see a falling edge, that corresponds to the voltage on the capacitor, charge on the capacitor, discharging through NMOS. No current is drawn from the supply. So, corresponding to the falling edge, you don't see anything. It stays flat. Right? This is assuming you don't have a short circuit current. Short circuit current is when both the transistors are on during a transition like this, right? So you can have a current like this. To keep the discussion a little easier, we'll ignore the short circuit current, therefore you won't have any spike. If you had short circuit current, you'll see a larger spike when the capacitor is charging, right? Because it is the current that is charging the capacitor as well as the current that is flowing into the ground. And then during the falling edge, you will simply have a short circuit current from the VDD. Capacitor will discharge through the NMOS. You will also have a short circuit current from VDD to ground. So you will have a smaller spike during the falling edge. Okay. So for one inverter, you expect to, so if I again ignore the short circuit current, for one inverter, you would expect to see spikes at F0. Right. But now you have three inverters. And these edges are going to be spaced equally, right? So for a uh, waveform like this, you will see that it will have spikes at 3F0. I assume that I have drawn a perfect 3F0. So the current waveform will be periodic with 3F0. In general, it is going to be periodic with NF0, where N is the number of inverters you have used in there. Quickly tell me the uh, power for one inverter. Assume that there is some capacitor C here and the signal is at F0. What is the power consumed by a single inverter? C, VDD square into F0. Let's assume that it is being driven by a clock at F. Right? Do you remember this result? So, quick way to uh, derive this is to simply look at what is the charge that is getting stored on the capacitor in every period? So that will be equal to C times 
VDD. Charge. Right? It is C into VDD. Therefore, the average current drawn from the supply is going to be this charge divided by huh, divided by T naught or this into F naught. Okay. So the average power is simply VDD into this. So that gives you C VDD square F naught. So if one inverter is consuming so much power, what is the power consumption of our reference design? Okay. So this will be equal to N times C VDD square into F naught. So far okay. Now let's say you uh, put in this uh, system in your, uh, put in this ring oscillator in your simulator. You simulate it and you found out that your F naught is very high. Let's say it is around 20 gigahertz. Right? It's much higher than what we require. You also estimated what is the power you get for this uh, frequency. So now we have to tweak the circuit such that you can come down from F naught equal to 20 gigahertz to F naught equal to 2 gigahertz. What all will you do to your reference design? What are the possible options to bring down the frequency? Bring down. Right now it is at 20 gigahertz. You want to bring it to 2 gigahertz. Yes. Yes, you can increase your N. What else? You have to increase TD, but adding buffer as in? Uh, huh. So basically you are increasing the number of stages, right? Yeah. What else? So you have to increase TD. Add extra capacitors, right? Huh. How would you decrease the current? So if you reduce the W, is, is that a good choice to reduce the W? No, it depends on the load capacitance. Huh. So your load capacitance is going to reduce, but more importantly, you started off with a minimum sized NMOS transistor, right? What else can you do to reduce the current? So width is not an option. You can increase the L, right? Anything else? Let's assume VDD is a constant, the transistor properties are constant. Think outside the box, right? You are thinking inside the ring oscillator now. Is there anything you can add outside the ring oscillator to bring down the frequency? Add a? That is like adding the C. Yeah, right? What else? So you have a ring that is oscillating at some F naught. Let's say you want to bring it down to F naught by M. So, D flip flop is along the right direction. What do you plan to do with the D flip flop? So, you are going to put a divider. Right. So, you can add a frequency divider here and you will get F naught by M. Right. So, divide by 2 is a circuit that all of you are familiar with. It is possible there are circuit implementations that can give you division by any integer. So, frequency divider is the next option. So now you have come up with multiple options and you want to judge which of them is a optimal method. Right? Now based on what parameters would you compare these methods? Power, good. <laughs> Power, area, what else? <laughs> Cost, so how do you? <laughs> That's actually a very good answer. Yeah, that is a very very practical answer. Right? Especially if you are the uh, manager of a company, the cost will come in terms of the H, the human resource required. Whether the if the design is going to take a longer time, it means you are going to pay someone for a longer time. <laughs> right. So cost is very relevant. But let's think from the perspective of a designer. Area is related, yeah. Power is also related in the sense that if your ring oscillator consumes more power, less customers will buy it. Yeah. So all of these are related, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. 
what else <coughs> there is another parameter that you have studied now which you should be able to answer leakage so basically power right yeah so our frequency is we are designing for a particular frequency right error in the frequency uh, so error in the frequency as in frequency stability is it across pvt so that we are not considering at all for now right but this is actually a good uh, thing so error in frequency but thing is we are not simulating for uh, pvt corners in any of the architectures right but this is a good answer what is in what way error in the frequency yeah we have dedicated lectures on this topic so <laughs> noise right you also will want to look at the jitter or the phase noise of the oscillator So another parameter that is usually of interest is the power supply sensitivity. Sensitivity. So let's define a KVDD. How should I define a KVDD for an oscillator? So you can either define it with respect to the TD or with respect to del F. But given that this is an oscillator. Frequency is the parameter of interest. So you can, yeah, you can do this as del F by del V D D. Now, how would you estimate this? You will, of course, estimate this using the simulation, right? You will try to get the values from simulation. But how would you go about estimating the K V D D, provided you have the simulation tool? So I, I didn't follow this. So you are plotting frequency versus VDD, right? And let's say you got some plot, then what do you do? Then you take the slope, right? So there is a VDD, nominal VDD that you are operating at. So you can plot it across the uh, across that VDD, and then you calculate the slope for it. Now, for a quick estimate, which is usually what you will want to do when you are starting out a design, instead of doing the whole plot, you can simply vary the VDD. By a small amount. Let's say from VDD you vary it by 10 percentage, and based on that one value, you quickly calculate what is the KVDD you get. Right? So in doing the plot is of course more uh, accurate method because you get to see how the KVDD is varying across the nominal point. But a quick estimation is to simply calculate it by changing VDD for one point and then estimating the KVDD. Okay. Now if you have multiple architectures. Right, and if these architectures, so when you take your reference design and you apply all of them, you will see that in that initial design, it's not necessary that all of them will go down to the same F naught. Right, you wanted to go to F naught by M, but you will get the get in the general vicinity of that number. So if the oscillation frequency of different architectures is different, then it is not fair to compare only the KVD. You will have to compare the normalized KVDD to the frequency. I understand. <laughs> so let me explain how this happens, right? What is the expression for F naught? It is one by two n times TD. Now let's say you changed your VDD by some small amount because of which this became TD plus delta TD. So you have some F naught plus delta F here. So I'll take TD outside. This becomes one by two n times TD into one plus delta T by TD. We use no binomial expansion. Take it to the numerator and ignore higher order terms. So this becomes one minus delta TD by TD. Okay. Now I'll take this factor one by two n TD inside. 1 by 2 n TD is your F naught, right? So this becomes F naught minus delta TD by TD into F naught. Okay. So comparing the LHS and RHS, your delta F is this factor. 
So your delta F is now equal to minus delta TD by TD into F0. So if you had multiple architectures, let's say A, B, both of them are connected to VDD and you are comparing the supply sensitivity of both the architectures, right? Effectively, though finally what you are interested in is the delta F, you, re you are really looking at how sensitive the delays in the circuit are to VDD. Now, if you compare this at different F0, let's say F0 1 and F0 2, the one with higher frequency will look like it has higher sensitivity. So ideally, you should be comparing this at the same frequency. Now, if that is not possible, you normalize it with respect to the frequency of oscillation. Right? So instead of comparing just the KVDD, you will be comparing KVDD by F0, where F0 is the frequency of oscillation of that architecture. Is that clear? Okay. So in the next class, sorry, KVDD will increase with frequency. Yes. Increase as in the magnitude is going to increase with frequency. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Ha, that's what I told you. So, uh, you are very familiar with the divide by two architectures because it's easy to implement using a flip flop. There are architectures that can give you division by any integer. So, you can get divide by 3, 5, all numbers. So, let me give you what uh, we'll do in the next class, right? We are going to consider each of these options and see how the, uh, what, by how much we should increase or decrease these parameters to reduce the frequency by m and also see the effect on power. Thank you.